Hey, Ding Dongs, I'm Jamie. I'm Richard. And this is Explain It to Jamie, the political comedy podcast in which I, Jamie, a politically innocent but curious fella from Toronto, Canada, has the complicated political happenings of the world explained to me by my politically savvy best friend, Richard Lamb. It me. Rico, it is so good to be back in the closet with you, <laughs> chatting <laughs> politics. Literally and figuratively. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, that remains to be seen. Yeah, that's right. Who yeah. knows? You know, yeah. 2019... You know, who knows what's going to happen? Yeah, it's like Schrodinger's closet. Like, <laughs> yeah. if I come out, I, w- I was always meant to come out. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, uh, I get, I don't know nothing about politics <laughs> or barely anything. Um, uh, or I'm scraping it together as, as time goes on. And yeah. my good pal Richard, who's very well read in politics, he. Helps me through because it's a, uh, you know, it's a, a crazy world and, and needs, needs explaining. And explaining from a crazy person like me, an insider. <laughs> I'm just as insane as the world is. And that's why I know how interest works. Or yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Or how whatever. Brady bonds work. Yeah. So um, strap in everybody because yeah. it's going to get good. Yeah. So Jamie, what are we learning about today? Well, I'm very excited because yeah. we're learning about prison abolition. Yeah. Which was a topic that I'm going to say was recommended. To That's us right. Yeah, by, we, by a, a long time uh, listener. Yeah, shout out to our listener Jesse Byers, who wanted to ask us about private prisons and prisons and whatnot. So hey, we're having a we have a prison episode. This yeah, is it. we're talking about prisons. And let this let, let this stand as proof that like I know you guys, you probably listen. And you're thinking, like, these guys don't read my messages. They're sitting up there in their ivory tower, drinking champagne out of like a hollowed out skull of uh, of uh, of. of uh, Man, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. I, th- I was thinking yeah. for some reason the first thing that popped in my head was like mailman, <laughs> and I feel bad because the post office workers in Canada are on strike, and they just really don't need people making goblets out of their skulls right now. They do not. They um, do not. Solidarity with yeah. the post workers strike. What they by the way. do need is for you to stop buying things off Amazon. They're just desperate <laughs> for you to stop buying things off Amazon. Like, yeah. it is destroying families for post office workers. Their legs are nubs at this point. Like, it is a devastating devastating blight on their profession yeah so but what can i say papa's gotta have his sopranos dvd box set (laughs) and i need it by thursday (laughs) yeah Yeah. um so yeah prison abolition the topic requested by jesse i'm excited to learn about it yeah i don't i don't i know literally fuck all about this is an incredibly awesome topic i got like so jazzed to talk about this topic because like prisons they're a funny thing and they just seem like they should exist like trees in the sky and the oceans. Yeah. But actually, when you start to think about it, prisons and talking about prisons, it kind of talk. It says a lot about our entire society, and in fact, in many ways, is the linchpin of our entire society. Ooh. That's right. I'm getting big. I'm getting <laughs> metaphysical. You thought you were gonna hear about prisons, but actually, the real prison. It's your mind. It's your mind, baby. It's your mind. It's your mind. And you've got the key. Keep listening. And that key is explain it to Jamie. All right. Let's (laughs) fucking hit this theme song and break us out of this trash correctional facility. I want to hear it. There it was. Oh, wow. Amazing. Here we are. Free men at last. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So, Jamie, do you know, what do you know about prison abolition, if anything? <laughs> uh, I mean, is that's where, it, uh, prison abolition, that's where they um, just, like, open the gates and, and, and let the scourge <laughs> run free. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, <laughs> it's, like, it's like the purge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like once a year... They let all the people out of the prison. Yeah. They can do whatever they want for 24 hours and they have to come back. And then they have to come back. Uh-huh. And if they don't, they go to prison. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good... Well, already, though, you're already piercing right to the heart, the philosophical heart of the matter. Yeah, baby. Um, no, I don't know much about prison abolition. Uh, not as... Because like, I, I, I mean, I didn't... When, when it was requested, I understood... It, in the way that it was phrased, that it is itself a thing. It's not just a couple of words that this guy wanted to know about. It's sort of like electoral reform or neoliberalism. It's like a. It's a movement. It's a burgeoning yeah. movement. Right. That's right. It's a. It's a. It's a thing. It's an activity. It's a concrete goal. Yeah. That 
is has a lot of people rallying behind it to try to make it a reality. Yeah. Yeah. So is that like that? I mean, we'll probably talk about, but this is like what they do in Norway. Instead of like locking people up, they, you know, read them. You know, I'll, I'll love you forever or whatever. And like, <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, yes. Hey, have you read that book as an adult? It yeah. is like nuclear strength shit. Yeah, that book w- will destroy me. Uh, I know. It's yeah. it's like the the predecessor to uh, Cats in the Cradle. Oh yeah, yeah. that's exactly <laughs> yeah. correct. Yeah. yeah, it's like it's like here. Do you want some baggage about your parents? Like, yeah. let me just give it to you right now. Yeah, they love you yeah. more than you love them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you will watch them die. Yeah, if. <laughs> all goes according to plan. Yeah. You know? Yeah. How so about get, that? So get your mom a goddamn card for Christmas. For Stick that in your sake. pipe and smoke it and then go to jail yeah. for being a, for a small drug offense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. Prison abolition. It, yeah, so, it is a thing. What, like, what is... Yeah. It's what it sounds like. So abolition as in abolish, as in get rid of. Prison abolition. Getting rid of prisons. Sure. And now... I'd invite you, this is going to be kind of a more philosophical episode and a less like history lesson lecture episode. Like, so prisons. I, what are what they? What are prisons? <laughs> well, think about it. Like prisons are, I'll, I'll, I'll make a few assumptions here. I'll make a few just positings and you can take them and run with them or, or respond to them as you see fit. So sure. like in our society, prison is kind of like, the worst place. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. the it's like hell. You know, if our society is like a religion, yeah. and prison's like hell, right? Sure. It's like it's like prison is you're you're taught about it as a kid. You know, it it exists as an idea f- to for you from like a very young age as like the place where the bad people go, mm-hmm. right? Um, and you're sort of taught to like fear it, and it's always like the last resort. You know what I mean? Like, um, and and it and it serves I, I would say that like our entire society or much of it is built on like the threat of prison mm-hmm. right sure so the main question is uh, at the heart of prison abolition is like one a crazy thing about our society is that prisons seem like totally inevitable irreplaceable and necessary right it's like of course we need prison. Where will the bad people go? Yeah, we've always had them. We always will. Right. Yeah, yeah. We haven't always had them, A, which is an interesting point. Um, they, they've, uh, modern, modern prisons have only existed since like the 1800s or 1700s. Right. And then... Um, what did they have before that? Uh, ca- just like capital punishment. Right, right. Just, <laughs> just <kill> like, <laughs> or like they'll cut your hand off right. or whatever. So we are moving up. Yeah, I mean, well, this is the theoretical thing, right? right, right. So the question is like, what are prisons actually for in your mind? Like, what should they actually be doing? Well, I mean, yeah, what they should be doing. Yeah, what should they, like, in the, the in, if they're working perfectly, what does a prison do? Theoretically, someone who's made bad decisions goes into prison and comes out understanding the bad decisions they've made and is is capable of making good decisions. Right, so this is a super important thing. Yeah. Um, when you think of prison working correctly, you think of it as, like, a a rehabilitative experience. You think... A person commits a crime, mm-hmm. they do something that causes harm or injury to others or violates a law that shouldn't be violated, they go to prison, they're isolated from society, they suffer a punishment, mm-hmm. and that punishment makes them not want to do that thing anymore. Because they're like, oh, I did this thing, a bad thing happened, I won't do that thing again. Right, right. Right? That's like the theory. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, uh, there's also, I mean, I, w- I, I guess it depends on who you ask, but because I, w- I would also say that some people would probably answer that as it, uh, it's a cost of time. You know, like time is the most valuable thing anyone has. Right. And so you've committed this crime, and so we will take time, the most valuable thing that everyone has. Right. Because you know? not everybody has money. We can't t- just take money from right. everybody. Exactly. You know, you know, everybody's got time, so we, we take that away. Mm-hmm. So I guess it depends on yeah whether you believe in rehabilitation or you just believe in like the slap the slapped you know wrist and and right yeah so that's a good point too it's mm-hmm. like there is like a time cost you're being punished it's like you're being fined time off your life yeah so the thing is that aspect of prison the like punishment aspect the idea that being imprisoned is like you lose time from your life that mm-hmm. you should have is actually really bad at not causing more crime. Right. It actually causes 
significantly more crime. Well, I right? imagine like people go to prison and they find themselves in this society that yes. is like already fully formed and as you said it's been around for 200 years yeah and it's 300. been run uh, 300 yeah. and has been run by gangsters and you know all manner of uh a, a person yeah and you're going to a place full of criminals i'm using heavy finger air quotes here because we're going to unpack that whole idea of what's a criminal and who's a criminal yeah, and that's yeah. a big part of this but like if the goal of prisons is to create a deterrent, like it's both punishment, it's punitive, that's like the, the technical word for it. So it's like a punishment for doing a bad thing. And it's also supposed to be a deterrent. It's like, right. because I got punished, I won't do the bad thing in the future. Right. Rehabilitate. Rehabilitation. Rehabilitation, quote unquote, is technically different from deterrence. Oh. Deterrence is like, ah, I suffered a bad consequence, so I won't do that thing. Rehabilitation is like a different process that can take place in prison. Right. Like right? I have. It's these... like I took classes, I went to therapy, I did tra skills training, right. I'm ready to re enter society. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, however, prison is like a terrible deterrent. Like, let, I'll just throw that out there. Even though, and this is and this is the thing about prisons. So much of why prisons function in our society and why we all accept it is just because it seems like what we were taught, mm -hmm. right? But the data really doesn't bear it out. So, like, in depending on which country you're looking at and what year you're looking at, because there's statistics, you know, everyone kind of pulls different statistics, but they all show similar things. Like, between two-thirds and, like, three-quarters of people who go into prison and come out are back in prison within two to five years. Mm -hmm. So that's like already a 66 to 75% fail rate. Right. Is right? it possible that it's because prison is too fun? I mean, that's a, a, a working <laughs> theory that we could have. Um, there's another statistic, which is that uh, prison is terrible. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, prison is a horrible place. Right. Prison Prisoners... But one of the statistics that I found the most sobering and the most illustrative of how shitty prison is, is that like suicide rates for prisoners are much, much higher than the average population. And so are suicide rates for prison guards. Whoa. So prison's not a good time for really anybody. Wow. Um, and, and, and there's many reasons why this is true. The first is that um, the act of being imprisoned is horrible yeah. well like behind just past the effect of like dehumanization like it's kind of it is torture yeah. right it is suffering yeah. it is it causes like pain distress and trauma to like be imprisoned to not own any of your time to not have privacy to not have objects to mm -hmm. not be able to tell what to wear to constantly be under authority threat of physical violence from guards threat of physical violence from inmates to be in a state of fear mm -hmm. you know what i mean that's trauma and that's suffering right mm. so already you have to look at prisons as like when you imprison someone you're not just like taking them out of society you're like hurting them mm -hmm. and that's part of the punishment quote unquote right right um but from trauma comes like a mixed up way of looking at the world well that's the thing right yeah. it's like when you take someone away from society and traumatize them as a punishment for breaking law and then re-release them into society after a while right, of being right. traumatized Especially, that actually kind of does the opposite of what you want it to yeah, do. Yeah, you know especially I mean? since I think if you looked at like a lot of prisoners, I'd say mo most of them probably have some sort of trauma in their life that that that. I mean, this is a vast generalization, yeah. but you know what I mean. Like when, when if, if someone f faces trauma, it's a they they mm -hmm. have this wound that they are now making up for in other ways in their life. And yes, sometimes it can be positive. Sometimes yes. it can have they can have a. a, a chip mm -hmm. on their shoulder and go and become a big successful businessman despite what the trauma made, yes. like, made them into but I think most of the time it, it results in you taking it out on people and things yes. and places. And You're on exactly the right path and I would say let's go even one step further and identify very clearly that past like psychological trauma which caused you to behave in ways that may be like aggressive or harmful mm -hmm. so many of the causes of crime are actually economic mm -hmm. and and social right the the vast majority of people who are in jail especially in the united states but also in canada we're really not innocent of this at all are in jail for property offenses so like breaking and entering or stealing stuff yeah. um where no one got hurt uh -huh. Or drug offenses, right? right? Or like prostitution, right? Right. Those are crimes, and like already, th like if you start to think about it, 
those are crimes which have like clear many of which have clear economic and social factors behind them where it's like this person is too poor right mm. or 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 mental health is often a, is a significant portion of the prison population is people who are who need mental care like and 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 mental health um, assistance mm. so al- already like these these causes are social right? it's like if this person had a home if they had access to drug drug treatment and rehabilitation if they had you know, be, uh, more options for getting skills and getting out of poverty. They wouldn't, ha- they, you know, they could help get help with their addictions that they wouldn't have to steal to fund their addictions or get mm-hmm. caught using the drugs or selling the drugs to make the money to live right. they, or they wouldn't have to be prostitutes. They wouldn't have to steal things, you know, like already you can start to see how there's a sort of like collective responsibility for these things. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like, uh, you know, this makes me think of like, the uh, an old like adage is the key to start the key to saving money is mm-hmm. start saving money yeah and like it sounds like a silly thing but it's as soon as you have money saved yeah you see like let's say i saved i work real hard i save two thousand mm-hmm. dollars and i have two thousand dollars in my bank account all of a sudden that bank like i'm like oh that look i can see it i can see the value of this thing of this work i've put in yeah and i want to build it more but the more yes. but like the more in debt you are the more likely you're to be like I'm I'll, do I'll it. just I'm gonna buy this thing because I'm already two thousand dollars in debt. So what's twenty one hundred dollars? Exactly. Debt? And sometimes you need a way over that hump, right? Yeah. If you could just get some help and get over that hump, you could start to build something. But while you're in that hole, it's so difficult to see how you can get out. Right. And how then, well, how would you explain though that poor people are worse than rich people? <laughs> <laughs> I would say, have you talked to a rich person lately? Because yeah. let me tell you, when I worked at a um, certain Toronto theater company that was, you know, where we rubbed elbows with some very wealthy people. Yeah. Let, let's just say that I got really fucking sick of having conversations about uh, what kind of espresso, mach- espresso machine they had in their boat garage. <laughs> Like I had that con- a real, that was a real conversation I had. Yeah. I mean, that sucked. Yeah. I'm sure. Also those people made all their money by helping corporations hide their money in the Cayman islands. So, you know, they're not like, sure. <laughs> like that, let's have a real talk about right. this. Yeah. That being said, it is a nightmare to drive a boat. If you're drowsy. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. And there's nothing I hate more than a low end espresso machine. Just clouding up the fucking trip. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, I get the foam, the foam was on top, it's a pasty color and it dissipates too quickly. And yeah. I just think my Filipino house housemaid is is a trash person. Yeah, if you, <laughs> if you can't afford a better espresso machine in your boathouse, like, sell yeah. your boat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. No, but this is an interesting thing, Jamie. Like, actually, you, you are, like, right on the trail of this because yeah. it's, so, let's, let's connect all these dots. We've already talked about the fact that, like, most crime even violent crime, as you've said, has larger social factors and isn't just about the single act of the crime, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can see usually in most cases, the web of factors, which leads to a person committing a crime. Mm -hmm. But the argument behind prison abolition, I mean, there are many arguments. And one of the most important ones is that the whole fact that prisons exist the way we use them, where it's like, you did a crime, you go to jail, just lets you divide the population to criminals and non-criminals, mm-hmm. right? When the difference between, you know, somebody who drives a van into ten people at in northern in the north of Toronto out of a like, you know, lonely and rage-filled pit of despair, um, fueled by online agitation and not masturbating, right? Exactly. Yeah. The difference between that guy. And a woman who's picked up as for her third prostitution offense and is sent to jail is Z- absolutely zero. enormous. Yeah, yeah. But in the current incarnation of our system, those people get sent to the same kind of place. Yeah, and they get essentially the same punishment. We have one final and overarching punishment for all quote-unquote crime. And those people are criminals. Mm-hmm. And other people in the world are not criminals. Whereas you could easily look at those people as... You know, they have this social web and I'm not a criminal because I have all these resources to draw on to prevent me from having to do crimes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm doing, again, air quotes every time in order to live or make my life, right? Like, like those already are very different problems. Why do we use the same solution to all these problems? It Mm -hmm. doesn't really make sense now that you think about it, right? Yeah. I was, what was that? I was watching something the other day and they were talking about this guy got charged with something and he had to get his GED, Mm. um, because there's a thing in the U.S. where I mean, it might be in Canada too. I don't know, but it, you know, if you if you 
get charged with something and you don't have a GED, you you face a higher punishment because there's more. Um, it's more likely that you will reoffend because right. statistically, and so a lot of these guys will get charged with a crime and then go in and like they'll be like, oh shit, I'll, I have to go finish my GED and they'll, right. they'll do their their exam and they'll get five years off or whatever, you uh -huh. know. But not everybody can do that. Not everybody, is, you know, has the the um, uh, mind to do that or right. the willpower or the desire to uh -huh. do that. Totally. And it does feel like it's like, well, who doesn't have their GED? It's like poor people. Right. Or people who grew up in in a in a bizarre circumstance, or Absolutely. you know people that were given up on by their parents or or whatever. You know, there's obviously yep. there's a million different reasons, but like that's a specific pocket of people that are just that's doing correct. more time in prison just because of w the circumstances yes. they were put in. Absolutely, and I would be doing the prison abolition movement a big disservice to not just like fully again connect this dot you've laid out mm -hmm. and say, for many people who who are the champions of prison abolition. And I think indeed for the realities of our current world, mm -hmm. it's, it's about race, right? right? And these systems were deliberately put in place to, in America especially, imprison black and Latino, <clears throat> Latinx people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's like on the books. Like mm -hmm. I want to make that very clear. This isn't an accusation. Like they're the modern... The way the modern like talk about law and order and criminals and stuff began in the United States with the civil rights movement mm -hmm. and prison replaced segregation, you know, imprisoning people replaced segregating people as like a tool for white people in power, especially, especially in the South, but everywhere right. to exert power over black populations because those black populations those minority populations are the ones who have those factors that are exactly what you just described, right? right more right, likely right. to be poor, why, more likely to not have high school education. And again, all of those things are a direct line to slavery, right? right. Like, essentially, this is, a, I mean, the, the great documentary about this that's right out right now is Ava DuVernay's documentary, it's called 13th, mm -hmm. right? Which is about the 13th Amendment in the United States, which abolished slavery, but left a loophole saying that you're allowed to use prisoners as slaves. Right. You're allowed to not pay prisoners for labor, basically. Right, which is why they make like 15 cents an hour. Exactly. That's why that's allowed. It's because there's a loophole built into the amendment that abolished slavery that right. you're allowed to use prisoners as slaves, cut to suddenly now all the Southern people want to put black people in prison. Right. It's like, you know, this isn't a very difficult <laughs> picture to draw, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So, and in Canada for us, it's our indigenous population, right? Mm -hmm. We try to dominate and destroy them. We've talked many times on many different episodes, I think three different episodes now about the kind of legacy of violence and repression and colonialism against indigenous people in Canada. Mm -hmm. And indigenous people appear very disproportionately in our prison system. And right. they are the ones who are trapped in the cycle of, oh, I'm in prison. You know, my sentence would be lighter if I could do this thing, but I don't have the resources to do that thing. I go into prison for a hard time. I come out, I'm still poor. I still don't have resources. I get put back into prison. Like this is the cycle that right. these people are trying to intervene in. All right. Okay. So what, like... What's the alternative? It's a great question. Go back to capital punishment. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Go back, straight back to capital punishment, baby. No, so let's break down those three, the, like those those components of prison that we were talking about. So there's like yeah. the punishment part, the deterrence part, mm -hmm. and the rehabilitation part, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time when people talk about like the positive aspects of prisons, well, they talk about deterrence. Like that's a that seems like it makes sense. Like it's like, oh, I did a bad thing. I won't do the bad thing in the future that made me this bad thing happen, right? right. But we've already said there's lots of statistics statistics that just, that just doesn't work like that because mm -hmm. it's so many larger factors than just a personal decision um, influence crime, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just about, oh, I'm a criminal, now I'm not a criminal. It's like about my resources. So prison doesn't work as a deterrent, right? Right. As a punishment, prison is horrible, as we said. It's like torturous and awful. I would also throw out, and I'm, I don't mean this to reflect on how I'm talking about prisoners, but like, you know, if you have a dog, um, I'm not calling prisoners dogs. I'm giving a kind of like larger metaphor here. Right. If you have a dog and you're training a dog, you're told not to punish them, right. but to reinforce positive, good behavior. You're, yeah. you're, and you're taught to just ignore negative, like bad behavior and give it no response and positively reward good behavior. And then eventually that's how you teach your dog 
good good habits, right? Sure. Um, and in a in a rough way, I would say people work the same in way. In a rough way. In a rough way. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's it's Barky the prison abolition dog. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Break the cycle of the carceral state, kids. <laughs> um, so, like as we've said, traumatizing a person and then re-releasing them into society if you do nothing to help their situation, really doesn't help anything. Yeah, well, it's like, you know, the, bullies are the children of bullies. Yes. You know, like, a, a child learns to communicate through yelling, through violence, yes. and then they communicate with their peers through yelling, through violence, right? through whatever, you know? Like and, you, and that's another really important point, actually, too, about the overall systems that lead people to crime is, like, intergenerational trauma. It's like your fi- your family was a bad situation. You just, if your family comes from poverty has violence in it and domestic abuse, physical danger. Mm-hmm. Like you, you are on a rough track yeah, and unless you need there's, help somehow. Unless there's some saving right? grace action that happens in your life that changes your point the of view. The vast majority yeah. of people in prison come from situations like that. And at that point, when it's so much of it is influenced by the environment you were raised in, like you do not stand a very good chance, frankly. Yeah. And that's unjust as fuck. Yeah, totally. Right? So, yeah. I mean, I, and I've talked to you about this before, but this is like my whole thing against ident- not just identity politics, but like sort mm-hmm. of identity anything is mm-hmm. that, you know, the only thing I am in the world is a human being or mm-hmm. like you know, it was, say that in any way you want. I'm a unit. I'm a, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. That's the only thing in the world I am. Everything else I do is an mm-hmm. action. And so like. I can do a criminal action. I can, I can do, I can say something yeah. racist. I can say something, uh, uh, you know, n- n- not nice or whatever. Yeah. But I'm not like you are not. A I am racist. not a racist. I am not yes. a criminal. I, I, I had an action that was this thing, yeah. and that's not meant to say like, oh, I'm not racist. I just said something no, that was racist. No, I think that most people who like talk about racism and understand racism racism would think that ra- the world would be a much better place if people actually did i uh, define racism as like an action you can perform yeah. as opposed to a, a label that you are because like wearing it as a label has like deeply poisoned the conversation about what racism is and how we can intervene in it right yeah this is a bit of a step off the track but i was in a um Bit of, not an argument, but a, but a, um, a, a, a heated a conversation. Fight. Yeah, a nunchuck <laughs> yeah, fight. Yeah, I was having a nunchuck <laughs> fight the other day with words. We were talking about this fella where uh, the 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 press was throwing around the word. Uh, he's a white supremacist a right. lot, and we were talking about you know actually pretty cordially about like is he or isn't he you right. know, and that the, this fellow was making very strong point. It was hard to argue with him because he's saying he's not like you know they, like it, it, you can't. You can't attach everybody into this bubble word, mm. and I agreed with him in that way. I said, "You're, no, I think you're actually right. Like it's, it's kind of, inge- mm-hmm. you know, ingenuine to to call him that. But when you look at these four things he did, it's not that. I, I mean, white supremacism is a huge and strong word to throw out. Mm-hmm. But like when you look at these four things he did, you go, what, what, who did they benefit? What did like who did they right. disservice? Yes, and like what are the what are the outcomes that is happening? You you may be right in saying he's not a white supremacist. I don't. I as I've just said, I don't think he is either. But I do think he's a human being who made four very bad actions that would that are perpetuating it, perpetuating yeah, uh, the white, white supremacism. supremacy. Right. And yeah, I mean he to my credit. He saw it my way. Yeah, yeah. but that's, but, I think, a good you know lens I mean? to view the world. Or it's like, it's just like um, the voter ID laws we were talking about on our U.S. midterm election. Yeah. Um, hey, fun advertisement. If you're hey. not a Patreon subscriber already, uh, every week we do a bonus episode. And this week, our bonus episode is going to be, hey, what happened in those midterm elections? Let's yeah. round up the midterm elections. So hop on that, guys. Yes. There's links all over. Look. Even just a little bit. Patreon.com slash explain it to Jamie. You can sign up to support us a little bit every month if you like the show. And you can hear an extra 20 minutes or so of content every week. Last week our episode was about the Brexit and what's going on with the Brexit. And this week it's about the U.S. midterms. Hey! Um, Back to the show! (laughs) Um, Um, So you you know what I mean? Like If if someone says you're a racist... yeah. Everybody in the world, mm-hmm. no matter who you are or your point of view, is going to Im- get your back yes. up and go, whoa, how do I put this thing to rest? Right. Whereas, you know, people people have said, you know, 
I, I've said stuff that's insensitive before. Right. And if someone says, hey, that thing you just said is actually like kind of not cool. Yeah. I go, oh, whoa. Was that action yes. that I just took a bad action? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We're all capable of bad actions. But if you learn, it's about mm -hmm. learning from those bad actions. But as soon as you say that action makes you this thing mm -hmm. and the fact that you are this thing means that I can write you off yeah. is like, it's a dangerous thing to do to a person. Well, and the problems with that attitude are the same as the problems with calling people prisoners. I would go, and I would just, yeah. I want to, the reason I brought up the U.S. midterms at all is I wanted to loop it back around and say it functions exactly like those voter ID laws that we were talking about, how they suppress voters. Like, sure, maybe the, the governors, the, the, the people in the state house in North Dakota can say, oh, we just wanted to make sure nobody does voter fraud, so we're re restricting the IDs that get used. It's not a race thing. Of course, the ID that they picked that no longer works just happens to affect all of the indigenous people who vote Democrat and not Republican. Right, what, a, right. what a funny coincidence, right? Sure, sure, so I would sure. say yeah, that's an exact kind of example of like, it is a white supremacist law, right? right? But it's, it's and, and even though it's like, to, it, you know... Racism so rarely they're like, the Indians shouldn't vote, right? Like that very rarely actually happens. Although it does, if you read any comments on any CBC <laughs> article about indigenous people, you'll find that plenty of people do not have the shame to not say those words. Sure, sure. But um, it's much more about, like you said, real world effect. And I think that so much ill is done by saying, well, no, he's not a white supremacist and leaving it at that instead of you taking that step of going, no, he's maybe sure maybe you can't say he's a white supremacist and just paint him with that entire brush but the man keeps doing things that are white supremacists so we should fu like functionally treat him like mm -hmm. he is a white supremacist yeah. or rather work against him as though we're struggling against white supremacy right yeah, yeah, yeah. cool um anyway so punishment's bad it doesn't really help yeah right it doesn't help stop crimes from happening because it doesn't address the problems that cause crimes to happen right 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 um and so when people talk about the good things prisons do they usually talk about rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. If you're able to take classes, if you're able to get your education in prison, if you're able to get therapy, if you're able to get drug treatment, you actually stand a much better chance of exiting prison and not reoffending and not getting put back into the system and continuing your life, mm -hmm. right? Then the, the trillion dollar question, because prisons are fucking expensive and we spend a shitload of money on them, mm -hmm. is why do you need the prison part yeah. to do that, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Sure. Why do you have to imprison people to do that? Yeah. You pro you actually just don't. And there's all kinds of alternatives to this. Um, one of the alternatives is called the hub policing model, which kind of is it involves a cult massive cultural shift on the part of police officers and the way police departments function, where when they arrest someone or detain someone for a crime, be it, you know, a property crime, uh, or, or often this is behavior related. So like, you know, acting threatening or something like that or or you know needing mental distress their their job becomes now not to just process them and put them in jail but to figure out what's wrong with them and connect them to the service they need do mm -hmm. they need mental health help do they need drug drug rehabilitation do they need therapy like what are what's going to stop this person from actually just like you know being a threat to other people right right, right. and let's take that let's have the police be the people who make that informed decision and bring people to the resources that they need. And that has worked in some smaller communities. I don't think it has let a huge urban trial yet, but that's called the hub policing model where like the police department is the center of many services yeah. and they act as like a feeder for that. What, it, it's like the, it's like in the wire when, um, uh, oh, what was he? What was he? He was like a Colonel or something. The guy who made uh, new Amsterdam, but he, mm -hmm. um, he was talking about when he was growing up, he grew up in, in this bad part of Baltimore and mm -hmm. there was a cop um, that was his neighborhood cop and he would walk around and he'd say hi and he knew your name and he's like I want to go back to that kind of policing where there's where we know the guy who's mm -hmm. on the corner and walking around he looks after our neighborhood and right. we have a relationship with him and he has a relationship with us and if we do something wrong he doesn't necessarily bring us straight to jail he'll bring us to our parents and he'll talk to our parents about it right. and I mean that's a huge amount of responsibility to put on a police officer but I guess police officers have like that's the job right? and, and to be frank like the current police culture in most major urban centers is like so far away from that. It is literally shoot first, ask questions later. I was just reading this week this incredible ProPublica research, uh, like investigative research story into an officer who showed up at a at a domestic violence call with a guy who was trying to do death by cop, mm -hmm. right? So he had an unloaded gun and he was like in tons of mental distress and drunk and 
basically was like trying to get the officers to shoot him. And this police officer kind of realized something was up, did, didn't want to shoot, like walked out. The guy has the gun on him. He didn't know what the gun was unloaded either, mm -hmm. but the cop, but he walked out. He was like, Hey, it's okay. It's okay. Just put your gun down. And the guy's got his gun and he's like, shoot me, shoot me, shoot me. You know? And this officer's like, no, put your gun down. It's okay. And then two other officers showed up, shot the guy immediately. Right. And the officer who didn't shoot got fired. Whoa. Yeah. Because they said he wasn't able to do his job in an so he was trying to do the exact kind of intervention that you're talking about right and he got fired for that job for that for doing that Crazy. so police culture has to change significantly for that to happen for that reason a lot of prison abolitionists and criminal justice kind of like reform people are really not optimistic about the police being a integral part of this solution because mm -hmm. police culture is very you know, the thin blue line, like we're this club, we yeah, look after yeah. ourselves Keep and each inside. other, we have Keep the responsibility the to do this. And it's very violent now. You know, it's a very violent yeah. organization. Anyway, so that's, that's one of the options. Right, right. Another option is what's called restorative justice. So restorative justice is a process where, uh, that focuses on like healing the hurt and harm that has been done by whatever this action is. Right. It, and, and it equally weights the victim's experience and the offender's experience, which is already a huge change, right? In this model, like mm -hmm. the person who is caught and held accountable for whatever this harmful thing they did is like brought into dialogue with the victim about what they're trying to, you try, they're trying to make the person who hurt them understand what's been done and how the harm has been done. And then a like, kind of, kind of like punishment or restitution is meted out that goes directly to the victim. Right. So you have to make a restitution directly to the person you hurt. And then both sides are given resources to kind of like get therapy, move past that, address what happened, right? Sure, so it's sure. like a holistic model around a crime that A, yeah, like I said, prioritizes the experience of the victim and the perpetrator together, but then also really s sets its sights on moving everyone through and past the experience in a way that is healing to them. Yeah, I was, I was just reading this thing that was talking about, uh, this guy was positing that you should, <laughs> that we should, take victim testimonies out of court mm -hmm. um he's like there's nothing wrong with like you know the victim being able to speak to the the perpetrator and say what mm -hmm. they did but he's like i don't think we uh they have any place that i don't think it has any place in court you know what i mean like the the, the jury shouldn't like because every jury person has a family they have a they have stakes they shouldn't have to like you know a, a teary um, speech from the mother of the of the the, the injured, mm -hmm. although it's you know no, it should not be discredited. Should, the the feelings are real and and should be valued as real. Yes, it should have nothing to do with how that criminal. It doesn't. It shouldn't matter if like you know if I steal a piece of bread from a bakery mm -hmm. versus steal uh, an heirloom from 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 a family you know it's mm -hmm. it's a crime it's it's like the right. val the value is the same it, the fact that the heirloom meant a lot to that person shouldn't actually matter the the, the right. you know what i mean the yeah i don't i don't know if i'm doing a good yeah. job of explaining but like the yeah if you kill someone you kill someone it like right. me killing this person shouldn't matter less because they didn't have anyone to cry in court. Right. And me killing this person because they, and they had a, a right. you know, da, 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 it matters so much more. So I understand how that argument could be made under our current justice system. Mm -hmm. um, what's interested, interesting to me about restorative justice is that it actually is the opposite of that. Right. It says, because there's not going to be, you're not going to like go to jail. You don't, you, there's not a jury like you're not getting convicted of anything. Mm -hmm. You've been brought into this process because you committed, like you, you this harm was done, mm -hmm. right? We've determined this harm was done. And so at this point, it is about the fact that this family heirloom is meaningful to me. It's not because we're going to influence the jury to send you to fucking jail. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen. It's about you realizing the, the harm you've inflicted and the victim seeing that you've realized the harm that you've inflicted. Sure. And in a way gives room for all of those other intangible elements of justice that are really not captured or valued by our current system to be, to have space mm -hmm. to be valued, right, right. right? Like in any situation where, you know, this is, it's like kind of a cliche, but I think it's true. And all of us can have like a personal connection to this. Like in any situation where you do something bad and you fuck up, the first thing you have to do in order for anything to happen is like, take responsibility and then also forgive yourself, right? Mm -hmm. You have to both like own that you did it and then believe that, you know, you're capable of 
learning from it and not doing it again. Mm -hmm. That's like essential, right? And I'm sure all of us have stories of a time in our lives that that happened to us. And I think all of us also have stories of times in our life, even on just interpersonal levels, where like someone not taking responsibility or not being able to forgive themselves mm -hmm. and move on, like blocked them somewhere or stuck them somewhere, right? And it, it causes more friction, more tension over time. And our whole criminal justice system is like a macrocosm of that very human element, right? Right, right. How do we, but how do we create a system for righting wrongs that takes all of that into account and actually works to make fewer wrongs in the long term, right? What if we were all in a prison? <laughs> <laughs> and nobody's a criminal. And nobody's a criminal. Well, if Amazon gets its way, then we certainly will be. Yeah, yeah. yeah in a way, when we, we, all, are, we are yeah, in a When we all live in a sanctioned Amazon dorm um, and we all have numbers instead of names, we will, yeah, we're getting there. Let's just say, like, that's an option for <laughs> sure. Um so that's one aspect. Um, another potential alternative option is this thing called transformative justice, which just means uh, you, it's kind of like more about taking action to improve the surrounding social conditions around right. crime, right? They give you a sex change. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, could, you couldn't be a good man. Yeah. So we'll see how you do as a woman. It's kind of yeah. like, uh, <laughs> fuck, what's, I'm trying to think of what that movie is where that happens. Where it's like you go to heaven and you get sent back to like try again. Um, oh, do you know what I'm talking about? No, I don't nah, know. never mind. Well, good digression. Yeah. Good, good riff. Perfect. Um, so, yeah. hey, if you know the answer to that, yeah, throw yeah. it in the comments. Throw it out there. Um, I would say, okay, so now let me round up a couple loose ends. Number one is like, what happens to the people who are like legitimately fucking dangerous? That, oh, I was going to say, there are some people that w won't, can't right. change. And I would say for those people, separation from society is necessary. Mm -hmm. And everyone who supports prison abolition would also say that. The so, key difference is the pr imprisonment is not the punishment. Right. Imprisonment is not is not there to make them suffer, right. right? It is there to protect everyone from them, but I think they'd be held in substantially better conditions than a prison currently is. Sure. And people would be like, well, why are you going to reward people? like?" And, and those people would be given as many resources to try to overcome whatever these things are as possible. Like there are many people in the world who are like mildly psychopathic, yeah. but they learn how to function in society, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? Um, and so much of these things are around social conditioning, right? It's like, if you can just learn how to operate in society without being a horrifying, violent person who's a threat to other people or a rapist or whatever, mm -hmm. you should learn how to do that and you should be given that chance. For those people who are truly irredeemable, and I do honestly believe that there is a small percentage of people who maybe are just evil, for lack of a better word, sure. you know, those people can be kept away from society. But that would be a very small percentage of people who truly actually that is for the best of everyone. You know what I mean? Right, right. And in the cases where that is for the best of everyone, I think that that's still an, that is an option. Yeah. But, but first you'd have to try to introduce that person back to society. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right. I, yeah, absolutely. It doesn't make sense. No. The way we do it now. Yeah. Um, there's a, one of the last things I want to say, I think is that prison functions in our current society to basically, um, get people who are inconvenient to the, evils of neoliberalism out of our way. It's mm -hmm. just to sweep them away from visibility, mm -hmm. right? Neoliberalism, we have a whole episode on this, so go back and listen to it, but in essentially, it essentially means like you're getting rid of the social services and social protections that the society used to offer to people in order to privatize more money for rich people who own companies, right? right, right. Or you're handing over social services to private companies who are going to run them for profit and make money off them and make them inaccessible to the people who really need them the most and have the least options. Yeah, right. So when you start taking away welfare, healthcare, mental health care, there, you know, options for people who are poorer, a, an increasingly large, the, 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 when you start raising the floor for stuff like that, you're just going to leave people behind in poverty right. and in desperation. And that means people have yeah, to eventually do crime. crimes, yeah, yeah. right? Right. That, that's just a, that's basic cause and effect. That's right. And so those people are just imprisoned under a current system because they're evidence that our system is fucking breaking or mm -hmm. it's like really not sustainable and it is really failing people to to privatize this much wealth, to steal this much wealth from society and save it for people who are hoarding so much of it that they could never spend it in a million lifetimes. You yeah, know? Well, it's like that celebrity thing. Whenever a celebrity <clears throat> commits a crime, 
You know, and they're like, yeah. they could do yes. six years in jail. Here's more evidence. Like, no, they're not. They're, they're going to yeah. pay $100,000 and leave tomorrow. Again, literally this week, there's this fucking billionaire from Florida, Jeffrey Epstein, who was running a private sex island where he like essentially coerced teenagers into like giving him massages and then like forced them to have sex with people like politicians celebrities like like dozens of people over the over many years this man was caught dead to fucking rights by the fbi like completely caught full prosecution full case fucking convicted and he went he did, I think, six years in jail, these heavy air quotes, in a VIP jail where he got to hire his own private security staff and he got to leave for 12 hours a day to go to work. Right. And he's still a billionaire when he got out. Yeah, and Drake comes and plays every morning. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. Actually, Hotline Bling is about him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just think about it. Go back and listen to it. Check it out. Yeah. Uh, so it's, yeah. Like, it's like, that's monstrous. That's like fucking... That's a thousand times more monstrous than anybody in the migrant caravan than anything any of them has ever done in their fucking lives. Like to run a multi-year like child sex ring. um, That's fucked up. Mm -hmm. And that dude is like living large. You know what I mean? This system's fucked and it doesn't make any sense. And the same way that we've disrupted taxis and we've, you know, disrupted all these traditional industries, Mm -hmm. like that forward thinkingness and that progressiveness should be applied to our prisons right but um, here's a question because we've i mean in the states prisons are privatized some of them are yeah and they're the best in the world (laughs) yeah that's right that's right (laughs) yeah we've never had more prisoners yeah yeah customer base is growing all the time something's going really well right (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. uh yeah so what's i mean is is there any that I, i mean that is just seems obviously evil it's yeah, like a company that benefits off of people being locked up is like oh you know obviously and then also then rents those people to companies for slave labor exactly <laughs> yeah. and they're incentive and now they're incentivized to lock up more people yes. you know like it, it just seems like a, a a dumb an obviously dumb move is mm-hmm. that like something that's catching on is that like you, you it know? currently has a pretty small percentage of the total prison population in america like certainly at the moment Prisons are the government's game. Mm-hmm. And and it is a phenomenon and a deeply immoral and fucked up phenomenon. It is not yet um, a widespread thing. Prison reform has like, it's one of the only issues left probably in North America that has like true bipartisan support. Like conservatives, Republicans, Democrats, conservatives, left-leaning people alike seem to agree that the criminal justice system is fucked up. But most people j- haven't realized that what's actually fucked up, or it's not like fully mainstream yet, What's fucked up is the idea of prison. Mm. It doesn't make sense for the like 95% of people who go to prison. Prison shouldn't be what happens to them. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, it yeah. just doesn't, it's when, when logical. It, when, when it is such a common thing to say of like, you know, it, it, it's such a cliche line in every TV show and movie where, where someone get, you know, they, they get themselves in hot water and they go like, I can't do prison. I can't go through yeah. prison. I can't do it. And we all listen to it and we all understand because we've seen the documentaries yeah. and we've seen the, all that. We understand. And it, yeah, it, it, it is, it's, it's so fucked up that it's such an obvious problem that yeah. we're all like, mm. Another thing I've said, a great quote I've seen said by prison abolitionists is like, if any of us were running a company that was being contracted by the government and did our jobs as badly as prisons, we'd be fucking fired so fast. Yeah. Like if you had like a two thirds to three quarter percent fail rate for every single one of your clients, you'd be fucking out the door immediately. Yeah, but for true. some reason, we just tolerate this system, which does not work. And mm. like the evidence that doesn't work is so clear. Yeah. I mean... Australia worked pretty well. Yeah, that's right. You're welcome, Australia. <laughs> yeah. Here's the argument for against prison reform. Yeah. yeah. You just send them to Mars with Elon. Yeah. yeah. You know what? That band, The Temper Trap, had that one cool song, and that means prisons are worth it. <laughs> Thanks, Australia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. Okay, well, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, I had never really... I, I I have heard of prison reform. I've heard of like change in the game. I mm-hmm. I never even considered not having prisons. Sort I think of like it's, that capitalist realism. Thing. Yeah, so you can't can't. Yeah, yeah. It's because, like because you're engulfed in it. It's hard to imagine a world without it. Yeah, and I and as on an optimistic note, it seems like a crazy idea that will never come to pass. But slavery was an institution that seemed insane that would never come to pass. You know, women getting the vote seemed insane and would never come to pass. Desegregation, all of these things. Right. Um, 
they were impossible until they weren't. And I think prison abolition, like people in the modern day who support prison abolition often just call themselves abolitionists. It's probably one of the issues in our modern time that's the closest parallel to sl what slavery was back in its day. Mm -hmm. Like, if you want to know what it was like to live at the time of slavery, consider your attitude towards prisons. You know what I mean? And they're an obviously immoral, inhumane, unnecessary institution, and yet they're everywhere and ubiquitous. And most of us probably don't even think about them 355 days of the year, unless you have a... a a family member or a friend who's incarcerated, you work with the system or whatever. But like for the average person who does not have a connection to prison, prisons are not on their minds. Yeah, well, I mean, you and I grew, in a, grew up in a, in a place and community in which it would be fairly rare to, yes. for someone to go go to prison. And so like if you hear about, oh, this person's going to jail, it's like, whoa, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what the fuck did they do? Well, they must have well, fucked up. Right? Whereas they, if you come from a neighborhood where, you know, it, one in five goes to prison, one yeah. in six goes to prison, all of a sudden you go, ah, it's just something some people do. You, you know, know what I'm thinking about right now? It's like the beginning of Jersey Boys where they like go to prison over and over and over again for like a series of like small petty crimes like in the right, 50s right, right. in New Jersey because they're like the Italian mob. Yeah. And it's like, it is because that was pre like all the kind of modern carceral, the, ma the area of mass incarceration as we call it before the war on drugs, before all this stuff. It's so, like prison was definitely probably a very different place in the 50s. You yeah. Know, where it'd be just kind of like, ah, hey, I got into prison and I just played cards with Sal Flatfingers <laughs> and, and, you know, Jimmy Side Lips yeah. for, 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 for four months. And then we walked out the door and the, the fellas picked us up in the jalopy. Yeah. You know, like it was a very different time. Well, and there, I, I, this brings up another thing. It's like I think about I think about this from time to time is that when you leave prison, you have a criminal record, mm -hmm. you know, and that criminal record prohibits you from doing certain things. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, from my point of view, I go, but the judge told you 10 years, that's your thing. You yeah. have to give 10 years and then you can yeah. come out. And, but, but it's no longer 10 years. It's now every sentence is a life sentence, you know, so to speak, Yeah. because we're taking 10 years. And on top of that, there's things, jobs you can't have. There's uh, many jobs you can't have. There's th places you can't go. There's things you can't yes. do. In some states in America, I mean, this just changed in Florida in the midterm elections. You can't vote. You, you, can, you can't vote after yeah, you go yeah. to prison. And that's fucking crazy. Yeah, especially since what's the prison rate in the U.S.? One in ten or something like that? Yeah, it's big. U.S. Uh, has 5% of the world's population and 20% of the world's prisoners. Good Isn't numbers, that? guys. Yeah. Those are good numbers. <laughs> it's good numbers. Yeah. Doing some, we're really doing some numbers on this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's so crazy, man. I don't want to go to prison. No. But you know what a really great way to make sure you don't go to prison is? What's that? Getting rid of prisons, bro. Yeah. Get on board, though. That's the move. Yeah. That's, what, that's exactly what like uh, uh, political people against it will argue. Is they're like, the reason these people want to get rid of prisons is so they can <laughs> yeah. you know, rape everybody all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. What's the Scandinavian country that's got the real liberal prison? Norway, right? I don't know. <laughs> there was like, well, tell you. well, there was that guy that was he 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 showed up to that Christian summer camp. And, oh and yeah, he all those that kids, is yeah, that is Norway. Norway. And he went and he ended up in this you know I mean on yeah. this island prison where in Norway where they you know he has his own cabin and mm -hmm. he has to chop wood and and you sort of live like from what it sounded like to me you live sort of a you know a rural isolated life mm -hmm. you have a tv you have movies you have the whole thing and they and they, you see a therapist regularly you're still like taken out of society but it's a you know the whole thing is a little bit more humane but the you know i, I heard about it from all these events and the big argument is like he showed up to a camp and shot you know 20 kids mm -hmm. or whatever and now he's living in some cabin watching movies you know and people were saying he should be you know whatever right. ca capital punishment locked up forever whatever you want to say yeah. But yeah, and this this is what really got my me thinking about it. It's like, but isn't the point that he leaves better? You know that like I I know it's yes. hard. It's it'd be it's really hard for those twenty families to to walk watch that guy eventually someday walk out of prison. But but really, as like a human experiment, mm -hmm. isn't that the goal isn't yes. isn't the goal Absolutely. like oh we we can take someone who's committed the worst actions possible and we can make them understand why they were bad and 
and um, reflect on those things and be sorry for those things mm-hmm. and 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 make and take actions and steps to change. That's what a what an amazing technology and what an amazing like show of our humanity. Yes, to do that absolutely. You know what I mean. I get that there's 20 dead kids mm-hmm. uh, and that, that would be, I, I can't say that myself, like, you know, if I had a family member who's killed by someone, I cannot say yeah. that I would be able to like forgive and forget. But I will, I will say too, that like in those situations, watching that person get killed, which mm-hmm. does still happen in some places or watching that person rot in prison forever is often actually not satisfying. Yeah. It doesn't create justice, yeah. you know? Well, it doesn't bring the person back. It certainly doesn't bring the it person back. It doesn't undo the action. And, and, it, and it doesn't create healing. Mm-hmm. It does not. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Anyway. <laughs> cool. <laughs> let's uh, break ourselves out of the prison of this closet yeah. and uh, and wrap this episode on up. Okay. Yeah. Wow, that's so interesting. I This has been a great episode. I, I, yeah, isn't yeah. it? A, it's, it's crazy how fast... The, the dominoes tumble on this one for me. The second I started reading about it, I was like, holy uh, shit. Yeah, wait. What? Yeah, it's like, oh yeah, why do, Why is it like this? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh man. I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing prison abolition as a much, much higher profile movement in oh, the yeah. coming years. Oh, that there we, maybe may come after uh, Trump's not president anymore. Yeah, right. Maybe, you know, when the, the airwaves aren't so flooded with yeah. just n- insanity. Yeah crazy hey if you like this episode share it with your friends yeah, that's share it around. that is the biggest way you can help us i know we got our patreon up and you can donate money and that's really nice we, we are so happy if you if you do that but like honestly it, the bet the best way to help us is to like share subscribe and recommend it to one friend that, mm-hmm. that goes a long way and it, it, it's free yeah um you can check us out on facebook explain to jamie explain to jamie.com twitter Instagram, Gmail, we have all of those things. SoundCloud, baby. Get in touch with us. Um, YouTube. Send us ideas for, yeah, we have a great YouTube that Jamie's been working on. Send us ideas for for topics you want to see covered. Ask us questions. I mean, Jamie made a joke earlier about people not knowing if we write them or or if we listen to their comments or not. Actually, they all know that we read their comments because we write back every single person who writes to us. You know, I've had people ask me questions about political things you know in a message on facebook or something i went back to every single person and some you know i sometimes in in great detail to be perfectly <laughs> honest so i'm happy to get those questions and field those questions for anybody and yeah. thanks to jesse byers for helping suggest this topic to us yeah absolutely uh, and until next time stay connected stay active i'm jamie i'm richard has been explain it to jamie